Good, good morning and welcome to the Council on Foreign Relations. We're going to get started in just a few minutes. Before we get started, I wanted to let everyone know that today's symposium is on the record and live streamed at CFR.org. We ask that while you're in the room here, you turn off all of your electronic devices so they don't interfere with the sound system. We have an overflow room out and to the left with a stream of the meeting. If you'd like to use an electronic device, you're more than welcome to do so there. We'd also love to welcome you back to the Council at a further date, and there's more information in the back of your program about upcoming meetings. Again, we'll start in just a few minutes, and we hope you enjoy the event. Uh, when is Emily going to make her announcement? She already did. Oh, she already did. Yeah. Oh, well, we're ahead of the score. Yeah. You want me to go right now? Yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, on behalf of Richard Haas, the president of the Council on Foreign Relations, let me uh, welcome you here today. I am Jim Lindsay, senior vice president and director of the David Rockefeller Studies Program, which is CFR's in-house think tank. Uh, it is our great pleasure to convene this symposium on Internet governance after Busan. I want to thank all of you for taking the time uh, to be here today. Uh, I also want to uh, give a special thanks to uh, the people who traveled here from out of town. All I had to do was uh, get on the metro and come in from Northern Virginia. I know some of you uh, flew a very, very long way. Uh, having recently just completed a long trip, I have much sympathy for you. Uh, giving uh, jet lag and the rest. But we're very glad to have you here participating in the conversation. Today's symposium was organized by CFR's Digital in Cyberspace Policy Program. Uh, we started the program last year to address one of the most challenging issues we face today, uh, how to keep the global internet open, secure, and resilient in the face of new threats. Uh, my good friend and colleague, Adam Siegel, directs the program. He is uh, the Maurice R. Greenberg Senior Fellow for China Studies here at CFR, in addition to directing the Digital and Cyberspace Program. Uh, and I'd like to thank Adam for putting together today's symposium. Uh, you can find out more about what the uh, Digital and Cyberspace Policy Program is doing by going to uh, our website, CFR.org. One of the requirements of my position is that I have to mention CFR.org at least three times in every speech I give. I've now done it twice. One more is coming. Uh, I would also urge you to uh, check out uh, the Digital and Cyberspace Policy Program's new blog, Net Politics. Uh, the most recent post, which I think went up uh, yesterday, discusses the role that disclosures about national policies on zero-day vulnerabilities could play in building confidence uh, among countries worried that their rivals and their enemies uh, will use such vulnerabilities against them. Now, today's symposium comes on the heels of the Plenipotentiary Conference 
of the International Telecommunications Union, uh, which I believe wrapped up just short of three weeks ago in Busan, South Korea. One of our goals with today's symposium is to explore the outcomes of the Busan meeting. Uh, the conference featured, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, fairly robust discussion, what we may describe as competing visions of what the internet should look like in the future and who should have say over it. Uh, <clears throat> some of those views triumph. The internet will look very different uh, in the future than it does today. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, we also hope uh, to discuss the current internet governance landscape and suggest some possible ways of moving forward. Uh, I have no doubt that our terrific lineup of speakers uh, will generate some great ideas for us. Uh, I should point out that today's conference is uh, generously supported uh, by Google and Intel. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Ben Blink uh, at Google and Audrey Plonk uh, at Intel uh, for making the symposium possible, so thank you. Uh, I'd also like to thank some people here at CFR for working so hard on today's event. Uh, the CFR meetings team, uh, led by Emily McLeod, uh, and Lila Mahnad were instrumental in playing the symposium. So thank you, Emily. Thank you, uh, Layla. Uh, uh, the CFR, thank you for trying to bail me out. My, my throat's shot, so I apologize. Uh, the CFR events team, uh, led by Rachel Peterson, uh, will be doing everything in their power to keep everything uh, running smoothly. So my thanks uh, to Rachel and her team. Uh, with that, I would like to turn the platform over to Aparna Sridhar, who will be presiding over our first session on the global debate on the ITU and internet governance. So, Aparna, it's all yours. I think everybody gets to go up with you, so you don't have to speak alone. Yes. Good morning, everyone. I'm Aparna Sridhar. I'm counsel at Google. Um, and it's a pleasure to moderate this session. Uh, as a quick reminder, the session is on the record, so all of you uh, be forewarned. Um, and I want to start by just briefly introducing the panelists. I know you have their uh, biographies, so I won't spend a ton of time on that. And then do a little bit of stage setting and then turn to my questions and then your questions. Um, so to my immediate right is Andrea Glorioso, European Union attache for information and communication technologies here in the United States. Um, Jefferson Nassif, uh, head of international affairs for Anatel, which is the Brazilian agency of telecommunications. Uh, and Eric Osiakwan, who is the former executive secretary um, of the African Internet Service Providers Association and the executive secretary of the Ghana ISP Association. Uh, so we have a good mix of government and industry and hopefully a lively discussion. Um, I was in Busan about three weeks ago, uh, but I see a few people here who were there and many people who were not. So for those of you who didn't have the pleasure of three weeks in a number of windowless conference rooms, I thought I would just give you a little bit of background um, and flavor for what happened. Um, so the International Telecommunication Union is an agency within the UN system. Um, and it is chartered to facilitate coordination and collaboration between nation states and matters related to telecommunications. Um, as a creature of the UN system, its remit is set by its member states. So uh, the ITU is actually includes most member states. Over 190 countries are members. Uh, every four years, the ITU convenes its plenipotentiary conference, at which ITU member states decide on the future role of the organization via a treaty-making process. 
the plenipotentiary conference adopts general policies for the, for the union. It adopts a scope of work, a strategic and financial plan, and establishes sort of the senior management team for the next four years. Um, during this year's meeting, we saw a lot of discussion about kind of what are the appropriate areas of work for the ITU. Uh, this is a conversation that goes back, I would say, tens of years, um, but is continually evolving. And one of the sort of underpinning questions is, how much do we want a government or intergovernmental organization to sort of lead policy or technology development with respect to not only the underlying sort of telecommunications technologies, but also the internet. Um, here in the US, we've embraced what we call a multi-stakeholder model where all parties participate. A government-led model would be a bit different. Um, so I thought we'd kick off the dialogue with, with the following. Um, in the lead up to the plenipotentiary meeting, we saw a lot of news coverage that suggested that this meeting could end with nations fundamentally divided, that there were going to be, that there was not going to be a meeting of the minds about what the ITU should do for the next four years. Um, and at the end of the day, we managed to reach a consensus in Busan. Um, and so I think what I would love to just kind of get perspectives on from each of the three of you is what were the key enablers or drivers of that consensus? Uh, I don't know if you want to start, Andrea, and we'll just go down the line. Sure, absolutely. Well, I would like, first of all, to thank the Council of Foreign Relations for organizing this and for having me here. I would like to thank all of you for being here, especially at this time of the day. Uh, I come from Italy, and I can tell you that at this time of the day, Italians do not have this sort of discussions normally. <laughs> it's particularly striking to me that we can all sit here and discuss about these important issues. Uh, on your question, on your point, Aparna, I, uh, I have uh, I've been working on internet governance issues for uh, quite a long time, probably more than I should have. And uh, it's my impression that there is always an underlying tone in any of this discussion, a kind of a Armageddon kind of approach to any discussion. It's always the end of the war. It's always the end of the internet. It's always somebody taking over the internet. But at the end of the day, if you look at most of the discussion that we've been having so far, uh, we have reached consensus more often than we haven't. And I think the reason why people had perhaps negative expectations about the plenipotentiary was mostly because of WICKET, the World Conference on International Communication of the ITU, which took place in 2012, which indeed uh, ended up with a split situation between countries. Now, there are different reasons why that happened in 2012, uh, and uh, I personally think that part of the reason why that particular situation uh, did not happen again at the plenipotentiary was mostly because people understood that at the end of the day, we, you can disagree in an agreeable way, or you can agree to disagree, and there will always be points or uh, issues on which you cannot reach total consensus, uh, but also that the internet is important enough for all of us that it's really not worth uh, to, uh, to um, lock yourself into endless discussions, and at a certain point you just have to agree to disagree and to move on. Also, let us not forget that when, when you look, unlike the World Conference on International Telecommunication, which was a very focused conference, the plenipotentiary itself covered a lot of grounds, of which internet governance issues or internet issues were, I'm, I wouldn't say a minor issue, but they were only part of the discussion. And I think that kind of colored the approach in the sense that people had a lot of work to do and they didn't want those particular discussions on the internet to necessarily derail the process in other parts of the, in other parts of the discussion that took place at the plenipotentiary. Great. Mm -hmm. Jefferson. Well, well, first, thank you and thanks uh, CFR for being here. It's a great opportunity for us and to express <coughs> the views of the Brazilian government in, in some points. Well, regarding the, uh, the positive results that we had in, in Busan this time, well, I can um, point maybe five or six uh, positive results. Uh, the first is that it's, good, it's very good to see that the consensus building is back to the process of ITU. Um, as Andrea said, after the misses of Wicket and, and plenipotentiary in, in 2010, 
it's very good to know that and, and to notice that now finally governments really uh, enter in a very good positive way to find consensus. And I think that, that it was uh, actually a process. After a wicket, we had the WTPF, the World Telecommunication Policy Forum, that established a, a mode stakeholder process to find consensus in six or almost seven opinions. That was very important for us to, to break um, uh, some uh, perceptions that ITU uh, wanted to take over the internet in, in, in Dubai in 2012. Then the other process that was very, very important for uh, uh, setting the stage for this plan potentiary conference uh, was the OASIS plus 10 process. This again was a multi stakeholder uh, process in which. Explain for folks what that WISIS plus 10 means. What was the WISIS? Because uh, I'm not yes. sure everybody yes, got that sure. context. So, uh, WISIS is the World Summit of Information Society. It was phased in, in two processes. The, the first phase was in 2003, and the second one in Tunis in, in 2005. And then it was decided by the United Nations, and actually the, the process that established the, uh, the WISIS, established also the, the review process. So we are in this phase of reviewing process, and uh, all the organization that was involved in the WISIS is now uh, promoting its evaluation process. So ITU uh, established it in, uh, for one year, and the results uh, were very good um, for countries, for uh, civil society, and, and ITU could create in a multi stakeholder process uh, a mechanism in which all could uh, uh, sit together and, 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 and put their um, concerns in these in two documents, the vision and, uh, and the overall uh, review. So that was very important to set a very good scenario for, for, for Busan. Another thing that I would like to, to mention is the, the thing that I, well, it, it was quite clear for us in, in Busan that the mood was different. The mood was different because of this process that I mentioned, but also because um, now we had actors with, a, with, a, with potential and, and, and really the, the, uh, the flexibility to negotiate. You know, we are not, we are not stuck in positions during this plenary potentiary. It was quite difficult for uh, Dubai in, in Wicked, because we noticed that the countries could not go too far, but it was very different now in Busan. And why do you think there was increased flexibility in 2014 that countries didn't have in 2012? What changed in, in that sort of two-year period? Oh, I think that first, uh, all this process that I mentioned created a, uh, a scenario in which we, we could at least uh, notice that we can trust more in each other, and that is not the intention of uh, the majority of countries that uh, that ITU or that are there are some aspects in internet governance that ITU will not definitely uh, take over. So now it's uh, it would be easier for countries there in in plenipotentiary to negotiate because we know uh, that ITU, for instance, in, in technical terms. Uh, wouldn't be wouldn't have a consensus about uh, taking over technical uh, aspects of internet governance, so it was uh, easier for countries understanding that to negotiate even more difficult things like uh, uh, the Council Working Group on Internet on cybersecurity issues. We're going to come back to both of those, but Eric, uh, based on your understanding, what do you think? Did you well? First, I think it would be interesting to see. Did you hear the same things in Ghana about sort of the potential for this meeting to really fracture along um, a set of lines that sort of didn't end in an agreed upon result? Was that the, was that the, was there discussion of the meeting at all? And, and was that discussion sort of a narrative of maybe there are going to be two sides? And then, you know, to the extent that you have a view, kind of what do you attribute the consensus to? Right. Uh, thanks very much. And also I want to thank uh, CFR for inviting me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be uh, on the panel and to join in this conversation. 
Um, so from an African perspective, or from sort of sitting uh, back in Ghana, unfortunately I was on in Busan, but I was following the uh, process before and during uh, the session. And I think that yes, you know, tempests were high. Uh, you know, there was a bit of sort of media, you know, hype as well. And so, um, given the history of what happened in 2012, there was sort of some agitation that probably this is going to be the make or break. But for me, as somebody who has been involved in the ICANN process uh, for a fair amount of time, I think um, the IET. Just to explain for people what ICANN is and what oh. the ICANN process is. Okay. So this is like a no good deed goes unpunished <laughs> moment. So ICANN is the Internet Corporation for Signing and Numbers, which is sort of the global body that oversees the Internet's unique identifiers. It's predominantly um, sort of looking at the technical functions, and it's a multi stakeholder bottom up process that involves all the stakeholders. So it has government from the, on the GAC, the Government Advisory Committee, it has the private sector civil society, the numbers of organizations, and et cetera. So it's a very inclusive body that uh, has this annual meetings that goes around the world. And ICANN tries to operate as much as possible on a consensus uh, um, base. And it's been an institution that has been governing the internet for a very long time. I guess uh, if you've looked at some of the materials, you'll see that. So um, from where I sit, I think that um, the ITU uh, trying to get into the whole internet governance process must show that it can be, build consensus, right? And I think the Secretary General did a good work in moderating the conversation in Busan to that consensus. And I think that one of the reasons why the internet community have thrived, the internet has thrived very well over the years, is ICANN's you know, bottom-up consensus building process that tries to involve all the actors. But most importantly, it tries to make an effort and reach out to the communities that are not as actively involved, especially in the developing world, Africa, uh, Southeast Asia, and uh, South America. And I think that um, that is very important, that all the voices are heard. But I also think that um, going to any meeting like that, there's always interest, right? People will come with their own proposals. But also that there's inherent interest in trying to understand and have a conversation and reach some understanding. Um, thirdly, I think also that um, it is not the end of the world. You know, th there's always more forums to come. And I think the fact that there are multiple forums um, and opportunities to discuss these proposals and to have these conversations is also very important beyond ICON and ITU. I think the other bodies that do, uh, including this, I think this will also have an impact on the conversation. So I think that having multiple opportunities for people to have a conversation uh, beyond just the IT was also part of why we got to where we were. That's, um, that's a great transition to my sort of more general question. One of the themes that really animated the conference were different, was different visions of what the ITU's role should be in internet governance or internet policy matters, um, if any, right? Uh, and how does that role differ from the role that national governments have? How does that role differ from the role of ICANN, for example? How does that role differ from the role of the Internet Engineering Task Force, which sets technical standards for the internet? So I wonder if each of you could just offer a quick perspective on that question. What If, if it were up to you and you were single-handedly writing the treaty or writing the le resolutions that accompany the treaty, what should be the role of the ITU in internet governance, if any? Well, I will start, and I must say that as a European Commission official, it's, it's very rare that I get asked if it were up to you. That's normally not <laughs> the way we work. Um, I would try to give a personal perspective, but also based on what is our actual position on this matter, which is that, first of all, uh, it is incumbent on us to remember that the ITU is a member-based and a member-driven organization. So the mission of the ITU is ultimately defined by its members. And we can have a discussion, we should have a discussion about the membership of the ITU, who is member, who is not, who is a sector member, who is not, who has voting rights, et cetera. That's an interesting discussion to have, but ultimately, it's not like the, as frankly some 
especially in the community that perhaps is not that into foreign relations or the UN system, uh, it, it's important to keep in mind that the ITU does not decide autonomously as an organization what to do and what not to do. And that was also one of the topics of discussion in Busan. Now, uh, I think that it's not correct and it would be, it would be both naive and frankly incorrect from a purely legal point of view to claim that the ITU has no role in internet matters. Uh, the question is, of course, what are the borders? And there, there are disagreements, that's quite clear. There are different positions. Um, ultimately, it's important to see the ITU, from my perspective, because you asked my perspective, but also from a European perspective, it's important to see the ITU as part of a broader ecosystem, of a broader network of different organizations, each of which has its own uh, strengths and weaknesses, and each of which should play a role. What is very important from our perspective is that Whatever is the role that each specific organization has, be it the ITU, be it ICANN, the ITF, uh, let's not forget also that uh, in the UN system itself, many other agencies are quite active uh, on interrelated matters. Uh, UNESCO is now working on a report on ethics on the internet. Uh, uh, the Human Rights Council has been working on, the, on these issues for quite some time. What is really important is that there is respect between these different organizations and good communication. Because what happens sometimes, uh, I was going to say often, but I'm trying to be optimistic, what happens sometimes is that there is frankly duplication of work. This different organization are, doing, uh, are working on the same issues from slightly different angles, uh, uh, which is good, but if these organizations do not talk to one another, then we are bound to have problems. And especially in a moment in which, quite frankly, in the internet's environment, uh, we do have a meeting fatigue. Because we have meetings every other month, uh, and we have uh, each organization now. We apparently we also have new initiatives with new meetings. Uh, that is not conducive at the end of the day towards true inclusiveness. Because we also have to remember that there are a lot of countries out there and a lot of citizens, a lot of organizations who should be involved into this discussion, but simply do not have the resources to go to 35 meetings per year. So it is important to. Each organization should focus on what it knows how to do best, and I do believe that the ITU has a certain comparative advantage in certain areas compared to other organizations. And what are those areas in 20 seconds or less? Uh, I can't go on the substance in 20 seconds, but I will say that the ITU is seen by many countries as an organization which respects their priorities more than others. Whether that is correct or not, it's not the issue, but the perception in a number of countries is that the ITU listens to their concerns. Again, I want to stress this, even if I go beyond the 20 second, it is not the opinion of the European Commission that the ITU is necessarily better than other organizations. What I'm trying to say is that there are countries out there who think that the ITU is, more, uh, is listening more to their concerns, and that is something that we should keep in mind. Jefferson. Good, great work. <laughs> great, great question, man because it will allow me to explain uh, many things. And beginning by the Brazilian position on uh, multi-stakeholderism and multilateralism. Well, in the Brazil perspective, uh, we think that both uh, concepts can and must live together. Uh, we think that, and President Tuma expressed it very well in the words that she uh, stated during the Net Mundial uh, speech, uh, that multi uh, we, we think that uh, the process uh, must be uh, a multi-stakeholder, but there are some aspects of the decision of the, uh, of the internet that decision-making decision -making process must be multilateral. So oh. there are some aspects in, in these important issues, such as uh, taxation, security, jurisdiction. There are many extraterritorial ter issues dealing with the internet uh, that those issues must be dealt in multilateral organizations. It's, it doesn't well, me mean, doesn't the mean that point. it's not multi-stakeholder process, but this multi-stakeholder process is important. But at the end, the, the decision-making must be dealt in multilateral organizations. So let me just follow up on the point um, a little bit further. And I understand sort of there's, there's this distinction between multi-stakeholderism and, and just, I'll throw out a rough definition because we talk about that term a lot, but generally a multi-stakeholder process, I think in the way that we're all describing it, is one where um, the, the government representatives and members of the technical community who sort of develop standards or understand sort of the technical aspects of the internet and private industry, uh, so companies like Google uh, and um, 
civil society and also end users of the internet all kind of collaborate on developing policy. Uh, obviously, a multilateral solution is a, is a state-based solution. Um, but Jefferson, to just to just probe a little bit further, you said that there are some topics that are appropriate for multilateral discussion. Um, and I guess what I would ask you is, do you think, and you know, we can take security, for example, or taxation, for example. I have two questions. One is, is it the case that these are subjects that are only appropriate for multilateral discussion? And they shouldn't be discussed in a multi-stakeholder way, or is it they should be discussed in both kinds of forums? So, fora, excuse me. Uh, so that's the first question. And the second question is, uh, there are more multilateral fora than the ITU. So are all of these topics ones that ought to be discussed, at least as it re they relate to communications within the ITU? Obviously, taxation for you know, wheat or whatever is probably not the ITU's remit. Mm -hmm. uh, but if something is multilateral and is roughly in this space, do you view the ITU as the right multilateral agency? Mm -hmm. Of course, ITU is not the right uh, multilateral organization to do with all uh, different uh, aspects of internet governance. Internet, go internet governance is so huge a uh, discussion that it's not ITU to do with that. We think that ITU uh, is basically on uh, on telecommunication uh, aspects and the technical aspects of, uh, for instance, uh, uh, radio frequency, which is uh, since internet is going more and more wireless, so it's very important for ITU uh, to cope to cope with it, and it's been uh, coping with it very well. But of course, it's not ITU to deal with taxation or or all the aspects of security. But we think that ITU must be involved in, in all of them. We think that, uh, just like Andrea said, uh, that all organizations must, must be together uh, to discuss all the issues. Uh, and the same for technical. It's not correct that we are, uh, we are saying that the discussions must be in the multilateral. Discussions must be multi-stakeholder. But the decision-making process, at the end, uh, if, for instance, a treaty uh, can be, or maybe better, to uh, to, to, to find a solution for, for some aspect, of course, it's going to be in a multilateral. And this is because of uh, difficulties that, that we find in multi-stakeholder process in the internet. Uh, the first is representation. The other thing is accountability. And the other thing is legitimacy. So to find, uh, to find answers for those three aspects of internet governance and multi-stakeholder is, is the thing that we must um, <coughs> try to find, and it's quite difficult. Eric, if it were up to you. Well, um, so I think that, so two, two views. One is um, I was involved in the WISIS process um, um, back in 2005, and, and I went to, went to the Tunis Summit. One of the things that um, came out of that conversation, which I, I, I think um, didn't sort of do well for the IT, was sort of um, all of the other stakeholders thought that we were not on the same level. Uh, in participating in that conversation. And, and I think the ITU has subsequently tried to uh, be more inclusive and in bringing everybody to the table. Um, the second point I want to make is, which I think is a good thing that the ITU took on, um, is this whole broadband, making broadband available and accessible and getting more people in the developing world online. Again, I think this is important coming from Africa where uh, most people, broad connectivity is a big challenge. So um, we can say all that we want to say here, but if majority of the people out there are not online and are not involved in the process, are not getting the experience, then we are lacking a certain consistency. Right? So I'm one of those people who really like the idea of the IT focusing on this whole broadband building, uh, a, bro a global coalition, and trying to push it. And I think that also want some of the things that the ITU has, the clout and the ability to, to convene and, and do, and I will agree with my other colleagues that I think um, there are different aspects of internet governance and there are different forums for sort of convening those conversations. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, we shouldn't aim to get everything into one platform because I think that would be defeatist in itself, right? Mm -hmm. So I want to turn a little bit to the role of sort of regional organizations or regional 
coordination. Um, Brazil and this the CETEL, which is the part of the Organization of American States that is uh, deals with telecommunications matters. Um, Brazil's obviously an important player within CETEL, an important player within the American region. The European Commission has often played an important role in organizing European values uh, with respect or views with respect to internet governance. Um, you often see within the ITU uh, the African countries caucusing and, and discussing together. Uh, to what extent do you think that sort of regional discussions or regional decision making is going to continue to play an important role in determining national views with respect to internet governance as we go forward? Uh, first of all, when it comes to, to Europe, uh, um, just for people to know that participation to the ATU is organized via the CPT, the Conference of European Postal and Telegraphs, I think, because it dates back to the times when we still had telegraphs. And uh, the chairmanship of the CPT is not of the European Commission. If I remember correctly, the current chairmanship is of Poland. So I cannot, I would not comment on that particular process. The European Commission has indeed tried to play the best possible role in helping coordination and communication within the European Union, which is our job, but also reaching out to some of our neighbors, uh, uh, neighboring countries and discussing with other regions. Now, on your specific question, uh, um, I think that there are there is an interesting tension when you look at the internet world and internet governance discussion because on the one hand you have this um, this wish for uh, universality the internet is global our position is that it should remain global and this is an official position of Europe by the way that it should remain global and unfragmented and that is a very noble goal that we are working for at the other hand on the other hand you also have to recognize that there are different in different parts of the world, you have different histories, you have different cultures, you have different, uh, also you have a different understanding, for example, to use the term that is being used quite a lot in this panel, and surprisingly, you have a different understanding of what multi-stakeholder actually means. Because much like democracy, everybody will tell you that they are multi-stakeholder, everybody, including countries which, quite frankly, I would personally have difficulties defining as multi-stakeholder. So there are different understandings, there are different cultures, and I think there is value in, uh, uh, in discussing within a region uh, to create positions within a region. What we have to avoid and what perhaps did not happen uh, in 2012 at the World Conference in International Telecommunication, uh, arguably one of the reasons why we had a split vote there, and what, on the other hand, I think did happen here at the ITU Plenipotentiary is very important that we do not forget about this global nature of the internet. Because at the end of the day, yes, we have different histories, we have different cultures. We have, let's be very frank about it, we also have different interests. Our industries have different interests. Strategically, we might have different objectives at any point in time. But I do strongly believe, and the Commission strongly believes, that a global, unified, or fragmented internet is for the benefit of all of all of us. And that is the approach that we have always taken and we continue to take uh, in this specific discussion. Again, keeping in mind, uh, and I, I would just say, I would just add this, uh, once you realize that there are different culture and histories and approaches and what have you, I think it's extremely important uh, and I think that most countries, including big countries, have done so in the run up to the plenipotentiary, which is one of the reasons why the plenipotentiary went quite well, from our perspective at least. Uh, it's very important to learn respect, uh, respect towards the differences. You have to try and understand what motivates your counterparts, uh, where your counterpart is coming from, uh, and uh, that is the first step always to try to find a common ground. If you go to your counterpart and you tell them you have to do this because, either because I say so or because it's the right thing to do, because I'm good or you're evil, uh, which happens, believe me, in the internet environment, that kind of line of argumentation is quite common, that doesn't bring you anywhere at the end of the day, especially in a world be which is becoming a lot more plurilateral than it used to be, in which unilateral uh, activities are more difficult than they used to be. Mm -hmm. Jefferson. Okay. Well, um, the regional organizations are important for us uh, because in this, uh, this is a moment where we can uh, actually test some of your contributions, some of your positions before the realization of the conference. Uh, for Plenipot, it happened, and it happened for two or three times in our region, and, and for other regions, for other uh, organizations, we can find even more uh, meetings. So it's very important for us to, to test positions, 
and, and not to, to come up with a, uh, with a very strong or some contributions that you, you know that it, it's not going to pass, or it's not going to have approval of others there in the conference. So uh, Brazil, in Brazil, we use uh, CITEL a lot um, to, um, to actually uh, to test some of our, of our contributions beforehand. It is very important uh, for the conference, for the planning board. And maybe if we could have this preparatory process during the wicket process, uh, we could have different uh, results during that conference. But uh, we must notice that regions are quite different. Even here in Americas, uh, we have uh, three, uh, basically three very different uh, realities. And the north and the middle, uh, with Caribbean countries and, and then Latin America countries. So uh, it's a very good exercise uh, to, to put the, the contributions, the, the, the visions, uh, tested in, in the international, in this uh, organization. It was uh, a surprise for Brazil, for instance, that we could have a common proposal on the uh, Council Working Group of Internet when we had uh, many countries, uh, Brazil, United States, and Canada together in only one contribution. That was very important for the conference, and, and it was very good for, for the region to have a common proposal on, on this issue. Just explain for people what that means, that there was a common proposal on the Council Working Group on the Internet. You know, what is the Council work on, Working Group on the Internet? What was the proposal? Uh, just briefly, so folks have a bit of context. Yes, okay, try. Well, this common proposal, the, the common proposals are established in CITEL. Uh, you have a common proposal and you have more than uh, eight countries voting for that proposal, and you don't have more than half opposing to it. So it's called an uh, inter-American proposal. This inter-American proposal was uh, to establish uh, a kind of opening more the process of the Council Working Group of uh, Internet Public Policy Issues in ITU. So uh, there were many countries that wanted this Council Working Group uh, totally opened and to open to all stakeholders, to all interested parts to take part of this uh, Council Working Group. But the Council Working Group was established closed just for uh, countries, just for member states as governments. So um, in the other side, there were many countries that wanted, many delegations that wanted this Council Working Group closed. So our intent was just putting uh, some visions together, uh, establish a middle ground between, between those uh, two different views. Then we, uh, we established, we were trying there in the conference uh, through this <coughs> inter-American proposal, uh, a way in which uh, the Council Work Group could be open to all members, to, to, all, to all membership of ITU. And the membership is uh, uh, are the governments, uh, the private companies, the associates, and the academia. Everyone that wanted to, that want to make part of ITU can be a member of ITU. So uh, our intention was to, to open it to all membership. But at the end, the, the proposal didn't get it. Actually, we um, presume and some other countries, we, we sit together and we decided uh, to, to establish, uh, uh, we, we decided to, to have two different uh, uh, moments of this consumer working group. One moment would be close to governments, but there would be uh, another moment where uh, all interested parties can, can participate and then provide inputs to the closed session. That was the solution that we found out. Um, Eric? Well, on the Africa side, I think that um, there was very interesting developments are going into the whole internet governance thing. So, for example, you saw regional uh, internet governance forums. So there was West African internet governance forums that I think there were two of them. There were three of them. There was one held in Nigeria. There was one in Ghana. There was one in Ivory Coast. Well, um, and then there was the internet governance forum that was held in East Africa. There was one in Kenya, I think there was one in Tanzania and then Southern Africa. Um, happy to be involved in this. And what this did also was permeate into the national uh, psyche. So in Ghana, for example, we had an Internet Governance Day where the idea was to bring the stakeholders in the country together, sit down, discuss the issues, come to some consensus, or at least lay out a couple of issues that were priority that then goes into the regional conversation. And then we tried to get that into an African Union sort of consensus, but it didn't really work out. 
So you see that in some of the uh, internet governance conversations, there were some countries that, you know, African countries that had a bit of a different view from others. But for me, what was most interesting, I said, was the fact that there was a process from the national level to the regional level and try to get a continent-wide consensus on the issue. And, I, and for me, it also gave an opportunity to, I mean, the grassroots organization that cannot participate in these global conversations to at least at the national or regional level make their views known. Right? So I think um, this participatory democracy or participatory way of getting views across, um, for me, I think was very enriching. Um, and also led to other things. For example, a lot of countries concluded that, look, you know, we think that we are really behind on uh, access um, and so some countries made access a priority, started de developing national broadband strategies. How do we make it more affordable? How do we get more people involved in the process? So from an African perspective, I think that, in my view, was very uh, interesting. Great. Well, I'm going to take the prerogative to ask one more question before turning it all over to you. Um, next year, as you mentioned, Jefferson, the UN will complete its 10-year review of the World Summit on Information Society process. So it will have been 10 years from the 2005 World Summit on Information Society meeting. Um, at the same time, uh, earlier this year, uh, the US Department of Commerce uh, began the process or kicked off the process of transitioning its stewardship of ICANN um, to a more multi-stakeholder community. Um, and I want and it seems to me that those are so the two signal events among many to watch out for in 2015. Curious uh, for all three of you uh, whether and how you're engaged in each of these processes and what you see as, you know, if, if we were to have the same meeting next year at the same time, and we were able to say this is the positive outcome from last year. What would what would a positive outcome look like for each of you? And I'm I'm going to start with Eric this time yeah. <laughs> since Andrea has gotten the first word a few times. Okay, so so one more trigger to add to that is it's also sort of 2015 is when we look at the million development goals right that we set for ourselves, right? It's it's, it's a very important time, and from where I sit, I think that this whole internet governance conversations uh, transition of ICANN. Uh, internet, etc., has to eventually sort of answer the question, and so what? Right. And I think the MDGs are very important indicators um, that we need to really pay attention to, uh, alleviating poverty, getting uh, people from, you know, onto the radar, etc. So I would like to see a connection between the two um, in a way that we can then set for ourselves globally another objective. Okay, the next 20 years we want to set maybe not call it Millennium Development Goals, but something else, right, that we then strive towards so that these conversations and these processes are not just, you know, talk, but we can actually be able to point ourselves in the direction that we're making certain progress as uh, the global common good. Yes. Well, you mentioned very important um, issues that we, we have to do in next year. And actually, I think that the positive results that we had in, in Busan right now it's because we are going to face uh, very important issues next, uh, next year. So I think that countries and, and some governments are um, spared uh, their energies to put in, in 2015. Uh, the CSTD process, the, the Commission on Science and Technology in the United Nations, the ECOSOC, and the United Nations General Assembly that we will have to decide on the, on the review process of WISIS, uh, there we have more difficult discussions and, and more tough negotiations. And in terms of transition of, uh, of ICANN and the accountability Before process. Before you I can say a little bit more about why or what will be the difficult discussions that you predict will happen next year. Well, actually, what do we want of WISIS? If we want WISIS to, to be uh, more effective, if we want uh, WISIS to touch the real important things that uh, couldn't be touched in, in the last 10 years. For instance, what are we going to do with IGF? What will be the role of IGF in the Internet Governance Forum uh, in this ecosystem? And 
uh, and, and the transition, transitioning process of ICANN is uh, extremely important. So those are the, the issues that will be dealt uh, in, in next year. I find it sometimes ironically funny that every year is the year in internet governance discussions and every year there is a major major decision to be taken, which is probably just a testament to the importance of, of to how people feel strongly about these topics. Now, very briefly, on, on, the, on the review process of the World Summit on the Information Society, what Jefferson recalls as the WS plus 10 review, if I remember correctly the name, uh, Europe has a very, the European Union has a very clear position. Uh, we want that review process to be open, multi-stakeholder, inclusive. Uh, my colleagues in New York at the General Assembly are right now negotiating with other countries to achieve that kind of consensus. On the transition of uh, the, I mean, the technical term, I think, uh, and there are colleagues in the room who can correct me, is the transition of the IANA contract or the IANA function. And as you define it, the change in the role of the US government so far in the stewardship of an important element, but not, frankly, the totality of the internet ICANN, the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, which is a contract with the US government, is an important entity, but is not in control of the internet, no matter what some politicians uh, seem to think. Um, that is a very important process, and I would say that it is very important more from a, a symbolic and political point of view than from a practical point of view. Because at the end of the day, right now, the role of the US government is, we might disagree how clerical it is, whether there are political decisions taken in what the US government does in its relationship with ICANN, but it is seen as symbolically very important. So that it's a process in which the European Commission and many EU member states are very much involved uh, in a constructive fashion. We do hope that we'll get to September 2015 when the current contract uh, expires uh, with uh, a new solution in our hands. Uh, but we completely agree that it is very important also to make things right rather than make things quick. On what if we, if we meet again one year from now, which I certainly hope so in such a wonderful environment, uh, perhaps a bit later in the morning, but that <laughs> can be decided <laughs> next year. Um, I will express a personal opinion here. I hope, I really do hope after, I think, slightly more than 10 years working on these issues, I hope that we will talk a little bit less about the next meeting, about the next General Assembly discussion, about the next uh, new acronym that certainly will have come up in the meantime. These are important discussions, don't misunderstand me, but I hope that next year we can talk a little bit less about these things and a little bit more about the substance. How do we ensure broadband access for everybody? How do we, access, how do we ensure trust online? Because let's not forget that, uh, and I completely agree with the way with Jefferson and with Eric, broadband access is extremely important, that's the basis. But people will not use the internet, whether it's for their personal purposes, for commerce, for uh, any other reason, unless they have trust in the internet. And that means cybersecurity, that means privacy, that means child protection, etc. So I hope that we will be able to get one year from now, look in each other's eyes and, and say, yes, we have made progress in these fields. Whatever is the forum in which these progress are made, whether it's a private public forum, whether it's in the United Nations, somewhere else, uh, personally speaking, at the end of the day, I don't really care. I just think that there are substantive issues that we need to work on collectively. And that is where I hope in one year from now, when we will meet again, we can tell each other, yes, we have done good work there. In addition to all the various uh, acronym-based discussions which continue to be important and will, I mean, whether I believe they're important or not, they will continue in any case. <laughs> right. Uh, so I think now we'll turn it over to you in the audience. Um, there's some, a couple of folks with mics on both sides. Um, for each question, Please wait for the mic and um, speak into it. And please also stand and state your name and affiliation. And I think the first question is the gentleman in the back. Uh, hey, Xu from uh, Voice of America. And uh, because of our limited time, allow me to ask a question in an apparently oversimplified way. Uh, it's obvious that uh, there are two competing visions about the future of the internet. One is American one, that is to keep the internet as free, as open as possible. The other is the Chinese one, that is to keep the internet as domesticated, as controlled as possible. I'm wondering what's the take by our distinguished panelists on this 
competition and competing visions. And also, since we have uh, Google uh, Council here, uh, I, I may add that perhaps Google was uh, caught in the crossfire between the two competing visions. Thank you very much. Well, I'll turn it over to all of you first, and then I'm happy to take the Google question at the end. Um, you know, are there two competing visions, and 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 if there are, how do we sort of go forward? Um, so, um, I, I sort of, I'll answer the question in an indirect way. I, I think one of the reasons why the internet has really tried is its decentralized nature, the fact that the intelligence of the network is at the edges, and everyone can connect and participate and use the internet, right? Or build it further. And I think that is a very unique characteristic compared to um, the old telephone system where the switch intelligence is in the middle, and you have to be connected to the middle in order to be able to get the benefits of using the telecom system. And I think that that unique characteristic defines how the internet should be looked at. In other words, um, by its nature, it's difficult to control because there's no one point where you can put your hand and say, because I hold this side and I hold that, you know, I'm controlling the whole internet. And, and so um, from where I sit, I think that um, the way the internet is going to be better is if we continue in that way where it is more decentralized and people can participate from the edges. Um, I tell you, for example, um, if you, look at Africa today, what we're seeing is there is a new emerging industry of software developers, starting companies, creating technology, um, empowering themselves. This is a huge that before they'll come out of college and don't have a job and they'll be looking for a job. But today, because they're exposed to the internet, they build this uh, skills of developing code, they begin to start their own company. So it's self-empowering. Um, and recently I was on a radio conversation, I was saying, I think there's a multi-billion industry that has been created out of the youth that were going to be a problem, but now they're becoming the solution. I mean, the company I personally invested in in 2007, these were three guys from college, and when they got out of college, because they were exposed to the internet, they were very empowered, they started this company. Um, seven years down the line, the company is turning over 12 million US, and it's employing 45 people in Ghana. I think that's very powerful. And it's because the internet reduces the barriers to, for example, entrepreneurship, to building new companies, to expressing yourself. I think those are very unique and powerful ways of empowering the youth. Today, the biggest problem in the world today is jobs. Uh, we are asking, how do we create jobs? How do we empower the youth? Africa is a very youth population. And I think that indirectly, because the way the internet is structured, is solving this problem. It's giving people the ability to uh, bring out their creative abilities. So, so I'm a very big fan of that, and I'm sort of obviously biased towards that, and I would like to see more of that. So I, I don't know if I've you know, indirectly sort of tried to sort of respond to your question. Jefferson. Well, it's a very good question, and uh, sometimes when we are there at night, you, uh, we are uh, anxious to, we are eager to, to listen more to Chinese delegation so that we can uh, try to understand what are their concepts regarding uh, their views of, uh, on internet. But uh, I think that um, in, uh, in terms of control and security, yes, they are much more centralized than in other countries. But in terms of innovation and the capacity of putting internet in the hands of everyone and, and trying to, uh, to foster business, I think they are increasing a lot. Uh, we have uh, just two examples, uh, two great companies from China, it's Alibaba and, and Huawei. Uh, they're in different, uh, one is uh, uh, commerce and e-commerce and, and the other one is infrastructure. Uh, well, they, they are huge companies and they are gaining more and more market around the world. So um, uh, they have a different view from, from the, the US, of course, in terms of control and security, but um, in terms of innovation and, and and using internet as a as a way to increase development and and innovation, I think they are U U.S. and China are in the same line. I think that there are indeed different visions about the future of the internet and the way in which the internet should be 
manage and govern in the sense of governance. Uh, by the way, I, I think it's, uh, it's important to underline that this, you mentioned US on the one side and China on the other side. Uh, I think we should say it's US and Europe on one side. Europe from that point of view, Europe and the US are fully aligned in the sense that we, both regions believe very strongly that we have to have an open internet and an unfragmented internet as a support to not only economic growth, but also the kind of democratic political discussion that we have in both regions. So I wanted to say that right from the start. Having said that, uh, I think it's always very important. You can disagree with the positions of a country or of any organization or people within a country. I think that it's important that we continue to have the right to disagree. But it's always very important to try to understand where that particular country is coming from. And let me mention another country, not China, but Russia. Uh, just a few weeks ago, I read about a survey made on uh, uh, Russian citizens. Uh, I checked with some very expert colleagues on Russia. They told me that that was actually a survey that I could trust, uh, unlike some of the, as much as you can trust surveys, by the way, but unlike some other information coming out of that country. But this survey was interesting because uh, following the approval by the Duma, the Russian parliament, uh, of a certain number of measures to control the internet, uh, are admittedly to, to curb child pornography I think, or offensive content online, 48% of Russian citizens out of the survey agreed with that particular law. Now the survey was interesting because the same survey was done one year ago and at the time 52% of citizens agreed, so there was a downward trend. But still 48% of citizens agreeing that the internet should be controlled, should be regulated in a rather aggressive way is quite striking from our point of view. So I think it's very important from uh, Europe and from the US, from all of us, industry, government, civil society, to understand why is that and engage uh, with where these countries are coming from. And the second point I would like to make is, and I purposefully did not use the term competing, but different, uh, not because I don't believe there is competition. There is competition, and sometimes it's fierce competition between these two different uh, or multiple different worldviews. But what is really, in my view, what is really important at this moment is, uh, you know, we know that certain countries have a particular view, worldview, and others have a particular worldview. That should not be surprising because it comes from a, a long history of these different parts of the world. But what is really important to focus in this moment is actually the rather large number of uh, regions, countries, organizations within countries that are actually quite undecided which way they should go. They have not yet taken a decision. And uh, those are the ones that we should focus all our energies on. Those are the ones that we should go to and convince them in a respectful way, not telling them you have to do this because we say so, but it's in your interest to go towards a more open, uh, more universal, uh, less fragmented internet. And that is perhaps the most difficult side because it's much easier, let's be frank, it's much easier to tell somebody you're wrong and I'm right uh, rather than trying to understand uh, why do you have that position which is different from mine and what can I do to try to convince you to get closer to my position. And maybe in the process, we might even understand better each other, which in my personal view is always a good result. Just to quickly answer your question, I think from our perspective, you know, a free and open internet is not necessarily an American value. It, it's a value that's shared by Google users across the world. Um, and, and it's a value that is shared by us within the company, regardless of whether we're Americans or not. Um, so I, I don't think we think of it in regional or national terms. We think of it much more in terms of what are the core values of the company and, and what are the core values that will best serve our, our end users. Um, so I see another question in the back. Again, please stand up and, and state your name and affiliation. Hi, my name is Liz Dahan. I work at Macro Advisory Partners. Thank you to the panelists. This is actually an interesting follow-on question to the last one, which is the head of the ITU, the next head of the ITU, will be from China. I would be really interested to hear from your government and interaction with the ITU uh, from a government perspective. What do you think his priorities are going to be? Do you think there's going to be any change? And any comments on him as an individual? Thank you. Andrea. Yeah. Or Jefferson, go ahead. Yes, well, first, uh, just because I'm an ITU for many years, so I, I think that I'm, I have to ask, to, to answer the, this question first. Well, I've been working with the, uh, the next Secretary General of ITU, Mr. Zhao, for, for many years. Um, he's in the organization for, for many years now. He was the, 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 script, the uh, director for the standardization sector, and he spent eight years there 
two mandates, and then two mandates as the Deputy Secretary General. And now he will have at least four more years as Secretary General. And well, it, it is interesting to have an, uh, a Chinese as the Secretary General of ITU. You have many other Chinese, and actually China uh, is obtaining uh, many uh, victories in international organizations. Uh, had important organizations, and the other one is World Health Organization. So, um, for us, actually, uh, as we know him, uh, I don't think uh, that having a Chinese there would have we we would be more influenced by uh, Chinese delegation uh, views uh, in the administration or in the decision, the decisions of ITU. Actually, I think it would be totally in the other way around uh, because of his nationality. I think that the Chinese delegation wouldn't be so vocal as they were before uh, as a precautionary uh, issue. You know, um, it would be much more difficult as an image of ITU uh, and also for the other countries uh, to keep, for instance, the contributory units to ITU uh, if the visions of, uh, of a more uh, uh, of more Chinese uh, there in, in, in his position, so uh, I don't think we'll have more about it. Explain quickly for people what the contributory units are, because it's not an intuitive uh, notion. Yes. Well, uh, the contributory units is how much countries pay and the, the membership pay for ITU, so that money. ITU can survive. It's money. <laughs> money. Yes. <laughs> Some countries pay a lot, and the United States is one of it, unfortunately. <laughs> and uh, so that ITU can survive. It's, it's money. Go ahead. Um, I will not comment on the person himself, as you seem to ask. I don't think that's appropriate because the person is not performing a function. And what is important to focus on is that function. Uh, uh, as I said at the beginning of, uh, of this panel, the ITU is a member-driven organization, and the Secretary General is the head of the Secretariat, which is at the service of the member states. So I see no reason why the nationality to be absolutely, and I don't want to be naive, but I deeply believe that the nationality of the Secretary General is at the end uh, less relevant than people might seem to think right now in the overall functioning uh, and operations of the ITU. Also, the new Secretary General has been elected uh, as a result of a democratic procedure within the ITU procedures that all member states of the ITU have agreed to. By the way, just for precision, the European Commission is a sector member of the ITU, so we did not vote. Uh, and I'm saying this without any implication, simply to, to state the facts. Uh, so I would simply add that we are quite happy that uh, two Europeans have actually been elected also in leadership position within the ITU, including the deputy. Uh, so I just wanted to share this. It's, uh, and again, uh, I see no reason why I'm happy being a European, uh, pardon me, a little bit of nationalism here, but I see no reason why their nationality will have necessarily a major impact uh, on the performance of their role. Frankly, people who work in this organization, in international organization, who, who have been doing so for a long time, as Jefferson mentioned, uh, you know, you tend to think uh, about the work that you're doing more in the sense of how can I serve the membership rather than how can I serve my home country. If anybody thought that, it, and I'm not talking about the ITU here, but more generally, nobody's going to get elected in leadership position in an international organization if uh, people think that he's going to serve the interests of his particular country. That's the way it works. And I associate myself with the comments. I think that it's in the interest of the ITU that um, its uh, deliberation and outcomes are not as influenced by um, one person who is the head, but it's more um, membership based, uh, which is uh, what the institutions should stand for. More questions in the middle. Uh, my name is Eugenia Kemble. I'm with the Foundation for Democratic Education. Uh, it seems to me that this last set of questions really get to the heart of the matter. I was troubled by the beginning of the conversation in terms of all the discussion about groups and committees and regional bodies and so on. Um, our colleague from the Voice of America, it seems to me, has raised the crit critical political question, um, an open vision versus a controlled vision. And I find myself wondering if there isn't within all of these regional bodies and other kinds of committees probably a division along lines that have to do with who lines up behind the open and who lines up behind the controlled vision of the internet. And certainly uh, in this particular case, uh, the United States and China 
are on opposite sides, and I think we haven't been clarified, uh, or it hasn't been clarified as to where uh, Google stands on this. So to get to the heart of the matter, um, if ITU now has, as it was said at the beginning, a much broader set of agenda goals, and this is the reason fights are being avoided and that there is a sense of consensus and a culture of cooperation, uh, what is really going on in terms of this debate about open versus closed? So I, I can take the Google piece, which if there was any doubt, we're on the side of open, not closed. Um, but for the rest of you, is the debate is the debate within the ITU really about open versus closed? And if it is, is the consensus merely a paper? The consensus that was achieved at Busan merely a papering over of those competing visions, like an agreement to disagree. I think is what you said, Jefferson. Yes, it's not actually about ITU. Uh, ITU is just a platform where countries um, establish their views and, and visions on, on what they want about their telecommunication platforms and, and their internet system. And, and of course, they are different. Uh, no one can disagree about that. But um, actually, uh, they will continue to, to get it open, to have it open, or to have it closed um, you know, with ITU, within ITU, or without ITU in any, in any way. So this is more a question of, um, uh, of their visions and what they want uh, to today in platforms and networks, and, and just uh, have an ITU as a platform to express their views. Uh, it's not ITU that's going to say that countries will have to open or to close their networks. Uh, just to clarify, when I, I welcome the question, and I apologize, by the way, if I have been unwillingly part of that bunch of people who talk more about meetings and committees than about the substance, I, I completely share you with. Having said that, you know, meetings and committees are where discussions are held and decisions are taken, so it is also important to understand where the action is. They're not the end of the story, but they're part of it. Having said that, uh, uh, what I referred to, I think it was me who referred to the broad agenda at the plenipotentiary. Just to be clear, some of the topics that were discussed there and on which there was consensus, including things such as uh, the allocation of uh, electromagnetic uh, or avoidance of interfe or interference uh, for medical devices and issues related to the transmission between airplanes, and this was a direct consequence of the problems we had with the Malaysian airline, and so on and so forth. So many of the issues that were discussed at the plenipotentiary did not have necessarily to do with the open or closed internet, and this was what I was referring to when I, when I was talking about the broader agenda at the plenipotentiary meeting. Uh, now, whether the ITU, I, I think that Jefferson hits the nail on his head, uh, you know, the ITU is a place where countries discuss. It's a member-driven organization. At the end of the day, it is not the ITU nor any other UN agency, not to be absolutely honest, not even the UN General <laughs> Assembly, that is going to oblige countries, if they don't want to, to go in one direction rather than another. Because you can have as many resolutions as you want, uh, that will not change uh, the trajectory of any particular country. And that is where, if I may, and I'm not sure that answers your point, uh, and I'm happy to continue this offline after the panel if you so wish, but it is very important to engage, besides engaging at the ITU, but engaging bilaterally, uh, plurilaterally, and not only by government, <coughs> by civil society, by industry, with all our counterparts to understand what are the, including China, by the way, Chinese industry, to understand why they are going the direction that they're going to, what are their priorities, where they're coming from, and what is their interest. Because again, you do not change people or countries' minds uh, telling them that they have to do something because we said so. You do that if you convince them that it is in their interest to go in a particular direction. And that is where I think that we should focus. I think we have been doing, both Europe and the US uh, have been doing good work from this point of view. Again, not only governments, we can certainly do more, and we should. Well, I, I think that uh, generally, um, if you're looking at a developing world, I think most people who align uh, where uh, it serves their best interests. Right. Um, if it helps you, and, and I like to connect this to real issues, um, forgive me, but I think that ultimately, um, I was happy that in, in Busan I wasn't there, but the conversation was around like, you know, this Malaysian aircraft, well, how come that we're in such an advanced world and the whole plane is missing and it took us so long and we don't have the systems to track? Um, 
Ebola is here, how can we use technology to address it? Um, that sort of stuff. So I think that those are the larger, bigger issues that will get people to align. Um, if you go to, I mean, when we did a lot of the internet governance issues in different countries, ultimately when you get people in a room, they want to understand how they can use technology to make their business better, to make their lives better, et cetera. And if an open internet will achieve that, they will go for it. Um, so, so that's the way I see it. I thought I saw Adam and then Audrey. Uh, I'm Adam Siegel from the Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, while I agree the open and closed uh, framing is, is useful, I wonder uh, if one way to complicate it or unpack it or whatever word you want to use um, and to draw out some of the other points I think that Andrea was making and, and Jefferson was making about how people look to the ITU as a legitimate partner for some issues uh, is the issue of cybersecurity, right? Which is at the wicket was a, was a major break um, but really fell down to that there were some legitimate concerns from developing countries about spam and other things that the U.S. also had legitimate concerns about control of free speech and uh, uh, the free flow of information. So it, it seems to me that when you look at a specific issue, as, as Eric was suggesting, that cybersecurity becomes one of these issues where people fall on different sides of it. Some of them do it because they have a vision of a closed uh, internet, and others do it because they have legitimate security concerns that they don't know how to address in any other way than through the ITU. So maybe we can speak a little bit about what the cyber cybersecurity discussions were at this meeting and, and what the future might look like. Since Jefferson spent a lot of time on that, I think he probably should go first. Yes. Oh, I, I had the opportunity to be the chairman of the, uh, of the Wicked article on cybersecurity. And then again now in, in Busan, uh, being chairman of Resolution uh, 130. And uh, it was very challenging and honor. And uh, we could at the end find uh, common, common ground on the text in, in 2012 as well. Um, that text was quite simple. It was just one paragraph in, in, in the ITRs. But um, now it's, it's a huge resolution, 130, and with different um, Visions. Uh, some countries wanted that um, that uh, use that ITU could be a platform in which countries could uh, actually implement more and more in terms of cooperation uh, and having ITU to be as an intermediary um, among different organizations and 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 having ITU as a as a support to implement certs um, to implement uh, national cybersecurity strategies. So an ITU is doing a lot about that, and it's important for developing countries to have ITU doing that, because actually they don't have capacity building to do so, and they want ITU to help them to implement those uh, capacity buildings and to, to, to further study issues that would be quite difficult for them to entrust all the organizations, uh, if not in international organizations, to do so. So th th there is a kind of a... Uh, trust in the, the scenario that developing, some developing countries really bear on ITU to do that. So, um, but there is actually a huge difference on, on what ITU and what an international organization can do in terms of cybersecurity. You, you know that with this uh, action line number five, C5 action line, uh, put ITU as a leading facilitator of this, uh, of, of this issue, the, the cybersecurity issue. And some countries think that um, uh, ITU, uh, in conjunction with all the organizations, uh, ITU has to, uh, to implement more and do more. And uh, of course, uh, my opinion, Brazil opinion, is that uh, we, uh, ITU uh, was entrusted in WISA's lines uh, to do that. And so ITU should perform um, with all the organizations, such as UNODC and uh, uh, human rights commissions and, and so on, so that we can uh, we can cope with uh, a broader scope of cybersecurity. But there are many differences, and the lines are, are quite difficult to to find. Explain in terms for of cybersecurity. people quickly before we turn to Eric and Andrea. In your mind, what is the practical impact of the updates? So, just to give people an idea of the framework of the treaty, there's the main treaty. Um, and then attached to the treaty are resolutions 
on a variety of topics, including one which is on cybersecurity. That's Resolution 130, and, and Jefferson chaired the group that uh, developed updates to that resolution. So explain to people sort of what you think are the practical impacts, what's going to be different over the next four years as a result of the updates that were agreed, if, if anything. Mm -hmm. Yes, well, actually, uh, countries started the discussion with, uh, with high demands. And because of the negotiation and because that we had a good mood at the end, uh, countries just uh, gave up their positions or they uh, exchanged those positions or exchanged or changed those lines and, and those phrases so that we can, could have at least the resolution approved and amended. But uh, actually, we, we don't see the resolution now as a, as a too different resolution as we had. In, in 2010, uh, we had a huge debate in this resolution again, and there were many modifications. But now, modifications were more um, subtle, and I don't see uh, differences, huge differences, or what ITU is going to do for the next cycle that it's not been done in the previous cycle. Any comments on cybersecurity? Uh, I would simply say that on the one hand, and Jefferson mentioned it, we had to realize that the ITU has been doing uh, activities in the field of cybersecurity in terms of capacity building, so not operational cybersecurity, which it hasn't been doing, it shouldn't be doing in our view, but it has been doing capacity building activities for a long time, and among other reasons why, because it was entrusted with this task by the WSIS, by the World Summit on the Information Society, which was, by the way, for those who are not familiar, it was a decision taken at the level of heads of state and government, so the highest possible political decision that can be taken. Having said that, I, I, know, I think that uh, just like the Resolution 130 on cybersecurity, in many other resolutions, the changes, the minor changes that were introduced were, as I'm saying, minor, so it, the situation at the ATU level has not changed very much. What I think is more interesting, and I suspect what Adam was trying to get at in order to complicate uh, everybody's lives, uh, uh, is uh, there are different understanding of what cybersecurity means. That is a reality that we had to face because there are parts of the world and there are certain countries which interpret the notion of uh, uh, cybersecurity or information security as they call it uh, as touching upon uh, uh, questions of content and control of content uh, which for example is not the position of the European Union at all as you might be aware the European Union has adopted a few months back it's a European cybersecurity strategy and in there we state very very clearly that uh, uh, whatever uh, I mean we have our ideas on how cybersecurity should be conducted uh, but whatever idea other people in other countries might have. From our point of view, the respect for human rights, including freedom of expression in that context, uh, is, is paramount. Perhaps one step that might be taken, and it is being taken, uh, uh, not necessarily the ITU, but in this particular moment at the OSCE, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, is to work together to better understand the terminology. What do we mean when we use the term cybersecurity? What do we mean when we use the term cyber attack? And so on and so forth. This is a work that is being conducted, if I remember correctly, uh, I think it was sponsored by the Swiss government, uh, and I think it was conducted by the New America Foundation uh, uh, here in DC, but I, I would have to double check that. I'm mentioning that because when there are disagreements on such core issues, such as cybersecurity, and let's be clear, cybersecurity is a core issue for everybody, not only for governments, not only for countries, but for citizens, for uh, the private sector, for everybody. So when there are disagreements uh, and core disagreements, perhaps the, a good first step and perhaps something which the ITU could also contribute to is to understand each other on the terminology so that we don't find ourselves two years down the road and we realize, as uh, sometimes happens between people, that we have actually been talking about completely different things. So we have absolutely no agreement on how to move forward. Eric. Yeah, I, I think that um, so the issue of cybersecurity is very broad. Um, as my colleagues have said, I think there are things that fall within the remit of the ITU, and there are things that the ITU is doing in capacity building and helping some member countries, creating awareness, et cetera, which is important. But I think that, I was speaking to myself with your last comment, that there needs to be some understanding of. Hand up, and then there was a gentleman. Thanks. Audrey Plunk with Intel Corporation. I just want to go back to the question before Adams about um, open versus control because there was a disconnect between 
the question asked and the interpretation of the question by the panel. So I, I believe you asked the question about uh, countries lining up behind openness or behind control, and then the responses were um, to openness versus being closed. And it seems to me there's a difference between closed and controlled, and I'm wondering if you might talk about that a little bit. I would love to do that, but I would like to know what you think is the difference between closed and controlled. I'm not on the panel. <laughs> <laughs> I, no, I, I know, that, that's not fair. So I, I think that it, the, the risk, it seems like, is that we oversimplify this sort of very black and white picture of things, that people are either, everything is either open or everything is either closed. And, I, and the reality of how both technology and the internet works is there's, a, there's some amount of control everywhere. It just depends on what you mean by control. And there's some amount of openness. And, and so I think we do ourselves a bit of a disservice if we talk about everything in very stark terms. And, um, and so the concept of control is very different than the concept of something being closed. Closed means perhaps you don't have access to it, certain people don't have access to it, perhaps it's not connected to the broader internet. Um, and I think that's what people worry about when they talk about balkanization. Um, con control is a very different thing. It's a very different thing than saying one can't have access. It might be something more about what kind of access you have, under what conditions, those sorts of things. So I just, I wanted to, to note the, the, the seeming disconnect between how the question was, I think, posed and how the panel interpreted it. Can I take this? So uh, thank you very much for providing your interpretation. That's good because we actually agree that yes, indeed. There is a difference between a, a closed system and a controlled system. Uh, and I also agree that uh, at the end of the day, there is no, no phenomenon in human life, no society that is completely uncontrolled and completely open. No society and the, the internet is part of society can function in that manner. The, the question there is uh, who applies the control, uh, under which conditions, uh, with which transparency, and with which accountability. And there you might argue that there are uh, at least in my view, uh, there are the, the division, if you want to call it that way, between different parts of the world, between uh, societies that see control as something that is necessary at the end of the day, but should be done in a transparent and accountable way, and societies which see control or government, which is controlled in a much more uh, untransparent way, mirrors quite closely the division between societies that see openness as a value or societies that see openness as much less a value. So from that point of view, uh, even though I recognize that uh, you, you give a very good contribution to unpack the concept, and it is true that close and control are not the same thing, but in practical terms, I'm not entirely sure that I see a huge difference. If I look at the map of the world, I'm not sure that I see a huge difference uh, in terms of this uh, division between open and close or open and controlled societies. To clarify, I think that the societies that are closed also tend to be more controlled in a way which is not transparent uh, and not accountable, while societies that are open and that want an open internet, they still have control because that is necessary, but they do it in a way that is more accountable and more transparent at the end of the day. With all limits of the case, and that doesn't mean that we should rest on our laurels, uh, we should just trust our governments, uh, you know, God save us from that, but uh, the division is there and we should recognize it. Either of you? Thank you. Thank you. Fred Tipson, I'm at the U.S. Institute of Peace. Let me push back even harder because I think this discussion becomes very unreal in talking about open and closed. Uh, we don't even agree in the United States what open means. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily accept my own government's definition of what the open internet with respect to privacy issues and ter counterterrorism and criminal prosecutions and so forth. Google, I'm not sure I want to, re to rely on Google to determine what stays up on YouTube. I mean, there. There are all sorts of issues about openness that we really need to get into because they're, they're the essence and there are life and death consequences for some of our choices. We can't agree with Australia on database and clouds and you know there are, there are all kinds of important issues we need to confront and, and calling it a debate between open and closed to me just avoids those very important choices that governments are making and the kinds of conversations that need to go on among governments in these various forums. Thank heaven the ITU isn't going to take on all of them, but we need a stronger multilateral process of debate because we have serious dif dif disagreements among Europe and the United States and various other countries, not, not to mention with, with China, Russia, and others. 
So let's go there rather than this grand discussion between whether we're open people or closed people. Responses I, uh, or thoughts? Yes, I do have a response to that and I apologize for taking the floor immediately again, but I do actually agree and I said it uh, during the panel that I, I want one year from now coming back, to come back here and say we have done discussion and action on substance. So I completely agree with you. Uh, I am not sure that this panel, but it's, I'm not the, the moderator, uh, I am a panelist as one of our colleagues that reminded me, but I'm not the moderator, so it's not up to me to decide uh, the specific constraints of the topic of discussion here, and that discussion would take us also a long time, and I'm happy to have a beer with you or any other kind of beverage to discuss that, uh, but I will say one thing. That's uh, two things, actually. The first is that I do not believe that there are such major differences when we talk about what, is, what are our values between Europe and the US. There are differences, but I do not think that they are that major, and we would do well to keep that in mind, especially when we go to the global stage and we are faced with countries which have way more differences from Europe and the US than between Europe and the US. And the second thing that I will say is that ultimately I think that you can apply a very easy litmus test to understand whether a country or a government or a society is open or not, uh, which is if you can ask that question. Because there are countries in which simply asking the kind of questions you know very well, considering the organization that you work for, there are countries in which simply asking that sort of question uh, will make you end up in jail. And that is not the case for the US and Europe and nor for the countries of the panelists that I'm sitting with. Either of you? Okay, I think we have one more question and then we'll probably have to wrap up. Uh, good morning, my name's Peter Dengay Thrush. I'm the former chairman of uh, Internet New Zealand. Just to declare my credentials, the motto of Internet New Zealand is an, an open and uncapturable internet. So I'm on that side of the camp. I'm also the uh, immediate past chairman of ICANN where I led uh, most of my time at ICANN in the effort to improve transparency and accountability, including the uh, ATRT1 exercise, which led eventually to the affirmation of commitment. So again, that's where I, where I come from. I think the answer to some of this is actually just to come back to a point that Andrea made, which is why there was greater flexibility and cooperation at the ITU was because of the success uh, that most of us had at Busan of keeping the ITU out of most of the internet-related material. And I think that's something that we started with but have moved away from. Most of the uh, resolutions where the internet activity of the IT was going to be increased were rejected. So what's going to happen as a result of that is not the discussions are going to move somewhere else. In fact, they're going to move, I hope, to places where open and accountable processes and democratic legitimate representation issues are openly discussed. So I think that's been the consequence. That's why there was openness at the ITU, and that's perhaps an answer to your question. It's, it's not a sign that the ITU is, is going to take these issues on in a more open and accountable way. The ITU is going to move out of these issues. Where they're going to move to, I think, is the exciting topic. Thanks. Any of you views on where these conversations might also take place or might move, um, or other reactions to Peter's thoughts? Well, I, I think that is, as, uh, as Eric said, uh, the more conversations that we can have about internet governance, the more conversations we have about privacy and openness, and now net neutrality is the issue that is uh, in, in the headlines, so the better. So um, uh, for a country like Brazil, uh, uh, the more discussions that we had, the better process, the better uh, regulation we have, the better uh, proposals we have in terms of, of law. That, that's what happened when we approved the, the, civil, the internet civil framework. We had many, many discussions. Uh, before having it approved by, by the Congress. So um, it's important for us to talk and, and to find commonalities uh, so that we can have better process and, and, and better results of these uh, discussions, no matter it's ITU or uh, IGF. Uh, what we really need is uh, it's an open debate, uh, fruitful uh, results at the end. Just briefly in response to, to Peter Dengetrash remark, uh, uh, First of all, what the ATU will or will not do, as was mentioned repeatedly, is a decision of its membership. And to understand what the ATU will or will not do, you just have to look at the agile 400 pages, I think it's more or less the final acts of the plenipotentiary, and there you get all the 
all the, everything that the ATU is supposed to do or not to do. But I, I stress this because sometimes there is this concept that the ATU as an organization decides autonomously what to do or what not to do, and that is simply not the case. And secondly, on, uh, I, I do think that many of the conversation that some countries wants, wanted and still want to have at the ATU are better placed elsewhere in other organizations which, uh, which have better resources or better understanding of how the internet works. That is fine, uh, but two, with two caveats. The first is that those other organizations, which include, to be absolutely clear, uh, ICANN, but it's not limited to ICANN, uh, also had to understand that they have to communicate uh, with UN agencies such as the ATU, that they have to keep in mind that they are not the center of the world either. If you're in an ecosystem, if you're in a pluralistic system, everybody has a role to play and there has to be communication between the various organizations. And secondly, and I think I did mention this uh, uh, during our conversation, we also have to keep in mind that we, we have to be a bit cautious, I think, uh, in uh, multiplying the fora of conversation. Because uh, it's very easy to say that, uh, and I'll just make one example, privacy or cybersecurity should be discussed, is being discussed, as a matter of fact, uh, in at least three, four, or five different regional or international public or private organization. But if you really want to engage the citizens at the end of the day, if you really want to engage uh, governments which are supposed to represent their citizens, but also the end users, uh, you cannot expect these people to participate in 25 meetings uh, in five different parts of the world uh, across a year. So what we believe that should also be one of our priorities is also to come up with better technological systems uh, to allow people to participate more effectively to this discussion, to understand what is being debated where, what is important for me. I mean, this is a debate that we're having with participative democracy and open government around the world, and we at the Commission, we see no reason why we cannot have the same discussion and we cannot develop the same or similar tools also when it comes to international discussion. If the purpose is to be really inclusive and to involve as many people as possible, which I, I know is certainly a joint objective of the US and of Europe, and I'm sure also of the countries where my panelists come from, my co-panelists come from. Eric, last word. Well, I, I agree with Peter, and I think that um, on that front, for example, if you take the ICANN process, my view is that I think um, we need to make the process better. Um, it, um, how do we get more people, get more inclusion? How do we get more broad base? How do we um, as uh, Andreas said, you know, um, the country people can afford five meetings a year and all over the world. But how can we make sure that we can get these people involved? And I think it's about improving the processes of engagement. And it's not just for ICANN, but for the other organizations that have different issues that they're discussing. You need to be self-evaluating and saying, how better can we do this? And I think by doing that, we'll create a better world and we'll be able to deal with the issues. Great. Well, thank you all for joining me in this discussion. I really appreciated it. Um, thank you all for the wonderful questions. Um, and I think with that, we'll wrap. Thank you.